Uh, good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to today's uh, Parisian Smart Learning Program. And uh, it's indeed a great privilege and honor to introduce our today's faculty. Um, today's faculty is none other than Dr. Raj Maheshwari, uh, a renowned urogynecologist of our country. And actually, she is the first gynecologist who did her formal training in urology and MCHA uh, from Government Medical College, Kil Kilpok, and is uh, uh, fondly known as the first urogynecologist uh, in India. Uh, just briefly stating about her, she is uh, uh, did her graduation uh, and then uh, post-graduation and diploma in gynecology. And after that, she did her residency in urology as I stated earlier, from Government Medical College, Kilpok, and uh, she finished her residency in 1985. After that, uh, uh, pursuing her ambitions and trying to work in the area of uh, uh, urogynecology, she went into a number of uh, uh, trainings, and her international exposure in uh, different training opportunity includes in Bristol, uh, um, in Dublin, uh, in... in, in um, in the area of lab urology and lab gynae surgery, the training in ultrasound from Bristol, and the training in various urinary incontinence surgeries from various countries like Korea, uh, Belgium, and US. She has uh, earned the distinction of having a fellowship. Um, there's a Commonwealth Fellowship in Urogynecology and Urodynamics. Um, number of papers. Uh, to her credit in the National Journal and the International Journal, number of presentations at the various levels in India as well as abroad. Uh, she is uh, currently the president of uh, uh, Urogynecology and Reconstructive Pelvic Surgery Society of India and is on the editorial board of uh, IU Yoga, International Urogynecology Association. Um, prestigious awards to her credit include Baden Lecture Award in 2006 and Al Fomstein as a speaker uh, in IJU in 2008. My dear colleagues, uh, uh, she is a teacher par excellence and has uh, an excellent uh, uh, skills in surgery. And I have great privilege in introducing uh, her to you all. And she'll be talking about a very important uh, uh, subject. This subject is uh, uh, probably not uh, uh, discussed in depth when you are undergoing training in, in, in uh, barring in uh, a few hospitals and few training centers. And uh, sometimes it happens is so there is a, uh, what you can say, the lack of uh, going into the detail of this subject, because this is not a very fascinating like a stone or uron, uh, uh, uroncology, but it is, a, it is a, a subject of importance, not only from the theory point of view, because you get a questions in, in, in any, any part of uh, your urology paper, you can get a question, a small note, but from practice point of view also, uh, there has to be uh, some exposure in, in, in this area because you will be getting this patient when you move out uh, from your residency and uh, you come into the practice, uh, whether you are working in a metro, whether you are working in a, uh, a two-tier city or a three-tier city, or you will be getting a call from your gynecology colleagues or from other colleagues regarding the management of uh, this condition. Uh, so I have great privilege uh, in uh, uh, inviting Dr. Rajmeshwari for a topic on anterior and apical compartment prolapse. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It is an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, am I uh, am I heard, sir? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Very, very well heard, ma'am. Okay. Uh, I hope my slide is also seen. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma and uh, it was kind of you to do the introduction. I'm very thankful to you, sir. And uh, USI has an excellent uh, um, office bearers like you who organize such wonderful teaching sessions. I thank you at the outset for that. And uh, let us move to the... Uh, topic that is the 
anterior compartmental defect repairs. And uh, I will just talk about some basic things about uh, the anatomy. So we all know that the pelvic organs are uh, supported by the pelvic floor and we have something like a hemic support. And the hemic being formed by the muscles, ligaments, fascia, and everything. So the bladder, urethra, uterus, and the rectum, anal canal, all these are well placed in their original position because of the excellent support provided by the pelvic organs. Ladies and gentlemen, let us just go through the basic things. We all know that the, this is called the pelvic floor. This is the aerial view, and this is the uh, view from the inferior uh, uh, view. And you can see that the elevator muscle uh, is there, and it is almost called as a basin, just holding all the pelvic organs. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is also a, a, a division saying that anterior compartment, middle compartment, and posterior compartment. And in the anterior compartment, we have the bladder, uh, the urethrovesical junction and the urethra. And you see when you have a well-supported pelvic floor, like what you see here, and uh, you know that uh, the, it is formed by the uh, muscle, the ligaments and fascia, and its attachment to each other. So you don't see any descent here. On the contrary, when there is damage to the pelvic floor uh, and it supports, then you can see a very nice descent of bladder and you, you can also see that the uterus also is getting dragged along with that. See, when, when you just take the anterior compartment, the bladder and the urethra, everything is nicely supported by the uh, pubocervical fascia. This fascia has an anterior attachment, lateral attachment, and posteriorly attached to the cervix. It is something like a trapezoid and uh, it is getting attached from the pubic bone to the ischial spine. And here it will be attached to the, uh, the pericervical ring. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just an aerial view showing you the pubourethral ligament, the white line, a white line extends from the pubic bone to the ischial spine. This will be the levati and a muscle. And uh, you know, the fascia is covering the muscle. And uh, here, posterior to the rectum, these muscles fuse to form the tendinous, uh, um, uh, uh, tendinous attachment and what is called as the levata plate. And here is the obturator internus muscle and you can see the obturator uh, foramen there. So uh, we have so many fascia. We all know that the corpus ligament is the uh, middle most aspect of the inguinal ligament. And this will be the white line that is extending from the pubic bone to a skill spine. And, uh, you know, this uh, on, on both sides, it will be attached to the, uh, the white line will be there and the pubocervical fascia will be attached to it. And there is also fascia covering the obturator internus muscle. And in the center, you see the, um, uh, the cardinal ligament complex here. And then posteriorly from the cervix, you can see the utero. Uh, sacral ligament. The sacrospinal ligament is at a slightly different level. And you can see uh, from the level of the ischial spine, you can see medial to that. And then you can see the internal parental vessels, nerves coming out. The sagittal section shows the different attachment of the ligaments. This will be the white line from the ischial spine to the pubic bone. This will be the pubourethral ligament and you have the cardinal ligament complex here, uterosacral ligament complex here. So anteriorly, you have the pubocervical fascia and posteriorly, you have the rectovaginal fascia. So when you take the axial section, this is what you would see. In the center, this is the cervix and you see the, uh, the parametrium or the cardinal ligament complex, transverse cervical ligament, and uh, anteriorly, you have the uh, pubourethral ligament here, and then pubocervical fascia here, and then posteriorly you will have the rectovaginal fascia, and uh, the, this will be the uterosacral ligament. The basic thing we need to consider in the anatomy. 
the classification how do they classify prolapse and uh, traditionally it is classified as sister seal rectus seal uterovaginal prolapse and wall prolapse but things changed and uh, uh, then we started saying it as anterior defect posterior defect central or apical defect depending upon that the organ of descent will be there then uh, professor john delancy came out with the uh, description of level 1 level 2 level 3 defects and depending upon the defect level the descent of the organ either uterus cervix or vault or the anterior vaginal or posterior vaginal wall descent will occur and this is how it was described the uh, john delancy's concept made a uh, great breakthrough and we all realized in level 1 that is the uterosacral ligament uh, cardinal ligament complex that is the level one so that suspends the apex or middle compartment that is the cervix uterus and in the absence of it the vault and in level two you have the attachment of the fascia in level three you have the fusion of the fascia so this is how it is suspended this picture shows you the uh, suspension of the uh, apex by the uterosacral uh, cardinal ligament complex and here you have the attachment of the fascia and in level three you have the fusion of the fascia. What really happens is if there is damage to this uterosacral cardinal ligament complex uh, and then the, uh, the descent will be depending upon the, uh, the organ it is suspending. So in all three levels you have different kinds of attachment. So what really happens next is, if there is a defect in uterosacral ligament complex, then you will get the uterus, cervix, or wall prolapse, or entrancy. If there is a defect in the lateral support, the white line or orcus tendons fascia pelvis, or pubocervical fascia, rectovaginal fascia, then you will have the anterovaginal wall descent or posterior vaginal wall descent. When there is a defect in the distal support, Anteriorly, the pubourethral ligament, you will have the urethral hypermobility or perineal descent. Ladies and gentlemen, often they combine this. If you look at the picture, so you can see the level one, level two, level three, the support and the organs lying. And similarly, you can see the anterior, middle uh, or apex and the posterior thing. Often they are combined together to give the description. So ladies and gentlemen, we know the prolapse of the uterus or uterovaginal prolapse, it just progresses. Uh, when there is a defect in the pelvic floor support, it is often the neuromuscular denervation, which occurs with childbirth induced trauma, or sometimes there can be inherent weakness of the uh, fascial ligaments, muscles, everything or it can be traumatic following uh, repeated surgeries. So many reasons are there. So as the, uh, as the descent progresses, uh, you get different uh, staging. So the picture shows you, if the descent of the uterus is within the vagina, it will be stage one. If it is at the level of the hymen, it will be stage two. If it comes beyond uh, uh, the hymenal level, it will be stage three. And if the whole thing comes out, it will be stage four. And what is this pop cue? This is another thing. See, always, this is not an egg. This is a sister seal, the anterior vaginal wall descent. Often patients describe, see, I have a bulge like, a, like an egg. So comparing a bulge to a known volume like an egg is imprecise. So uh, people started having the a pop Q quantification, which is an universally accepted description, particularly useful for research purpose. So you have used the hymen as the reference point. Uh, any, any measurement above it will be negative and below it will be positive. Then we make the grid like this. It is uh, quite easy if you can just follow it. So there are six points. Anteriorly, there are two points, AA and BA. And then you have the C point, D point. Posteriorly, you have AP and PP. Ladies and gentlemen, then you also have three more measurements. The measurement of the genital hiatus, 
perineal body and total vaginal leg. This is an animation picture which I borrowed from Professor Paul Riz, just to show you the points. You have to, um, uh, when while you are measuring certain points, you have to reduce the prolapse. See, now this is reduced. It is. It may not be a prolapse also, but to, just to show you the, uh, the points, I am using this picture. So when I say AA, that means it is three centimeters uh, proximal to the external urethral meatus in the anterior vaginal wall. The significance of AA is it indicates urethrovesical junction. When I say BA, it means when there is a prolapse, the maximum descent of the prolapse point will be taken as B. When I say C, it will be the leading edge of the cervix. When I say D, it will indicate the, uh, the location of the pouch of Douglas. BP will be the maximum descent in the posterior vaginal wall. And AP will be the just three centimeter um, uh, proximal to the foreshed in the posterior vaginal wall. Then you have to measure the total vaginal length, the genital hiatus, and the perineal body. So ladies and gentlemen, let us just look at the anterior compartment now. So we know that uh, these are the three structures which are there in the anterior compartment. And uh, you know, there will be a bulge. And you know that uh, the picture, uh, the line diagram showing you how nicely the bladder has come out. And the MRI is just showing you and it confirms it. Ladies and gentlemen, the main defect is the defect in the pubocervical fascia. The pubocervical fascia is a trapezoid fascia attachment. It is extending from the pubic bone to the ischial spine laterally, and then it gets attached to the, the pericervical ring. So there can be different types of cystocele, uh, different sized containing different, uh, uh, I mean, you know, uh, so these shape size vary. But the content will always be either uh, the bladder with the urethrovesical junction or something like that. So it is recommended that you refer it as anterior vaginal wall prolapse rather than cystocele. And then how common is the anterior vaginal wall prolapse? Compared to the posterior uh, compartmental defect, it is twice more common. Compared to the apical prolapse, the anterior compartmental uh, uh, defect can be three times more common. So it is important to realize that it uh, the uh, descent, the anterior vaginal wall prolapse causes anatomical and functional disturbances, which is very important to remember. Let us start with the anatomical first. So there can be different types of defects. There can be a central defect, paravaginal defect, transverse tear, or even mixed tear. So if you look at the vaginally, if you see, the, you can see this is the midline defect, this is the lateral defect, and this is the transverse defect. If you look at the aerial view, you can see the midline and the lateral. The lateral will be the paravaginal defect. So ladies and gentlemen, so we have the central sister seal or distension sister seal, which occurs due to midline defect in the pubocervical fascia, or there can be lateral or displacement cystocele, which is called as the paravaginal defect, which is much more common. 70 to 80% of the patients will have the paravaginal defect. So how do we differentiate a central defect from the paravaginal defect? The central defect, there will be a bulge. Even if you do the support test, the bulge will be persistent and the rugosity will not be there. The problem is there is a defect in the pubocervical fascia and you see the bulge. And then what is this paravaginal defect? What really happens here is the pubocervical fascia itself gets detached from the pericervical ring. That becomes the, uh, the paravaginal defect. You can see how, how does it occur. See, just imagine the swing and you can, the hemac, you can see there is a defect here and this will be the central defect, okay? But when there is a detachment here like this, how it affects the um, hemax uh, configuration. Ladies and gentlemen, how do we differentiate the paravaginal defect? 
see there will be loss of anterior lateral sulcus and uh, there may be rugosity and the support test will be positive. So how do we do the support test? Use an instrument to reduce the bulge. You see the bulge has completely disappeared. Then it is likely to be a paravaginal defect. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, often it will be a mix up. You must remember that also. See, there is a condition in which there is a separation of the pubocervical fascia from the pericervical ring. When it occurs, there will be bulge in the anterior phonix and there will not be any rugosity also. Sometimes uh, what really happens is the pericervical ring itself gets detached from the uterosacral ligament. Then what happens is there is descent of the cervix, uterus, vault, all these things. That is, there is apical descent along with the anterior defect. So how do we address these problems? We have the vaginal repairs, uh, traditional anterior gulpography, vaginal paravaginal repair, and uh, people used to do and the uh, mesh augmented repairs and uh, the, even the kits, pre-designed kits were used, not anymore. And there are abdominal approach, laparoscopic and robotic approach to repair the anterior compartmental defects. So ladies and gentlemen, so this defect, the central defect, which, is, which occurs only in 15 to 20% of the uh, women with the, with the sister seal, so we all have been trained to make a midline incision, dissect the vaginal wall away from the underlying tissue, identify the pubocervical fascia and approximate it. And that is what is called as the, um, the fascial repair for the central defect. We do this correct, this repair, and we feel very happy. But what really happens is often women come back with a recurrent bulge in the vaginal wall. So the, why does it happen? Hmm? So we, people have reported a high success rate, 42 to 100 percent. Various authors have done and reported the success. But still, um, say uh, 58 percent uh, can fail. And it is in uh, way back in, in the early 19th century, it is said that the only problem in plastic gynecology left unresolved is the permanent cure of cystocy. So if you look at this, this was <coughs> described by John Delancey, when the trapezoid is attached, transverse attachment is preserved, you see there is no bulge. When, when this transverse attachment is detached, you can see there is a bulge. So what is important for you is during surgery, not simply plicating the fissure and the midline, but also to restore the transverse attachment, you have to reattach the pubocervical fascia back to the pericervical ring. And even in the absence of uterus in post hysterectomy patients, you have to attach it to the newly created vault. So that is the most important part to remember while you're doing an uh, anterior vaginal wall prolapse repair. So plicating the fascia will take care of only a central defect. But reattaching the fascia, transverse re uh, restoration attachment is very important to the, you have to reattach it to the, either the pericervical ring or to the newly created vault. That is the important step in repairing the paravaginal defect repair. So the basic principle is, this will be the uh, pubocervical fascia. This is the newly created vault with a uh, uterosacral ligament, cardinal ligament complex. You need to reattach the transverse attachment of the pubocervical ba uh, fascia back to the vault. That is the most important thing. Then what about the vaginal paravagin? See, you can see how this uh, transverse attachment gets detached, the trapezoid gets detached. You see the bladder. And uh, 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 Bob Schill, he described about the vaginal paravaginal defect. And there are others who tried this, but eventually it has been given up because of the occurrence of the complications. We don't do vaginal paravaginal repair any longer. Then if you look at this picture, 
So this is the pubic cervical fascia. This will be the white line. Detachment of the fascia from the white line results in paravaginal defect. So it is logical to reattach the fascia back to the white line, either by uh, the formal open operation or by laparoscopic technique or by robotic procedure. So if the patient has stress incontinence, you can always combine burst corpus suspension along with the repair of the paravaginal defect. So ladies and gentlemen, it has uh, provided quite a high success rate. So it is worth always considering it, but still the, uh, the uh, uh, people have reported, Weber has reported 70% failure rate and the others have reported 43 to 70%. Reoperation rate, nearly 30%. With this, the pelvic surgeons were desperate and they moved towards using the prosthetic materials like a polypropylene mesh to augment the native tissue repair. So what really happened is after, um, uh, after plicating the fascia, they used to keep a, a mesh uh, as an uh, under, uh, underlying the repair and then uh, they fixed it. And then emerge the pre-designed kits. So you plicate the fascia, you keep a uh, mesh as an overlay, or you use the pre-designed kits like this and uh, fix the, um, uh, the uh, mesh. So only thing is, what really has happened is, it did offer a quite a high success rate. It did, but it also resulted in many, many complications like mesh extrusion, and the need to reoperate. So, because of this, uh, routinely using mesh for anterior uh, defect is discouraged. And then came the option of using the absorbable mesh. Weber and Sand used the uh, polyglactin mesh, but the Cochrane review subsequently showed that there is no advantage using in using the absorbable mesh. And they also reported the polypropylene mesh, despite the mesh extrusion uh, rate and the complication, it does um, uh, carry less recurrence rate. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2011, the FDA warned about the usage of vaginal mesh because of the high occurrence of a dyspareunia, of vaginal pain, mesh extrusion, and all the other complications. So all the mesh products have been withdrawn from the market. Then, uh, um, the, uh, then came the newer lightweight uh, polypropylene mesh with an objective to decrease the mesh complications like mesh extrusion. See, so Altman, they, he used uphold a lightweight mesh for apical prolapse repair and anterior compartmental defect repair. So is uh, Deteric. They have reported a significantly reduced reoperation rate for mesh exposure. And then people started using other autologous material uh, as uh, uh, because the, if you use the autologous material, then the risk of host rejection infection were likely to be less. Uh, they started using allografts, the, uh, the autologous vaginal patch or the cadaveric uh, uh, fascia lata. They also tried the xenografts, xenografts using porcine dermis or small intestine. But eventually they concluded that if you have a case of recurrent anterior vaginal wall descent, it's better to go in for synthetic polypropylene mesh which carries better prognosis than doing the native tissue repair. And uh, comparatively in recurrent prolapse, the biological graft or absorbable mesh are not going to help the situation. And there is level one evidence to and grade a recommendation for using the polypropylene mesh in uh, recurrent anterior vaginal wall prolapse. Ladies and gentlemen, it is also noted that the gold bath and the sand they uh, reported when you combine the pubovaginal sling along with anterior repair, there is a significant decrease in the recurrence rate of cystocele from 42 to 
that is a point worth remembering. And similarly, when there is associated anterior vaginal wall prolapse and apical descent, uh, you know, uh, when the prolapse is within the hymen, um, then the uh, apical support may not be that bad. But when it, when it comes beyond the hymen, there is associated chance of a loss of apical support. So apex, in fact, offers a significant support to the anterior vaginal wall. Even the best repairs of anterior and posterior wall will fail if you fail to repair the associated apical uh, defect. Ladies and gentlemen, um, when you combine the apical repair along with the anterior repair, it significantly reduces the reoperation rate from 20% to 11.3%. So it, it is combining the apical suspension along with the anterior posterior repair has grade B recommendation and there is evidence available to it. Sometimes you get uh, uh, multi-level defects, level one defect, level two defect, or sometimes even level three defect with the uterus or without uterus, post gastrectomy wall prolapse level. So in these circumstances, um, when you address the apical prolapse um, and combine it with the anterior wall support procedures, see, you can notice that it may interact with the concomitant vaginal apical suspension procedures. For example, if I do a sacrospinous ligament suspension, what really happens is it is a posterior attachment and the chances of recurrence of the anterior vaginal wall can be as high as 37%. So when you select the technique to repair the apical prolapse, you have to consider these points because the uh, support of the apex and the anterior uh, vaginal wall, they have the uh, interrelation. So similarly, when, uh, when your patient, ha when, you, when there is an abdominal sacral or laparoscopic or robotic uh, and paravaginal defect repair, and in, in another group, if you do the vaginal repair along with sacrospinous ligament fixation, the evidence shows superior outcome with abdominal approach compared to vaginal. It has grade B recommendation. Ladies and gentlemen, let us look at the functional problems which occurs with the um, anterior vaginal wall prolapse. There can be bladder outlet obstruction, there can be detrusor dysfunction, there can be urinary incontinence. Let us start with the bladder outlet obstruction. Ladies and gentlemen, there can be bladder outlet obstruction with apical, anterior or posterior prolapse. The, uh, with the lower grade of prolapse, prolapse uh, within the hymen, they can remain typically asymptomatic. But even the low-grade prolapse, approximately 3% of them are likely to have the bladder outlet obstruction. 70% of women with significant uterovaginal prolapse may have the bladder outlet obstruction. Even though prolapse affects the voiding function, Coates et al. have shown that majority of the women with severe prolapse still white effectively. See, almost half of the <coughs> half of the women with prolapse have a feeling of incomplete bladder empty. But if, when you subject them for urodynamic study, only 30% of the advanced prolapse patients will have urodynamic evidence of bladder outlet obstruction. So when you look at the causes of bladder outlet obstruction, 24% contributed by severe urogenital prolapse. Similarly, 12% contributed by the sister seal to the uh, bladder outlet of, uh, obstruction. So ladies and gentlemen, with increased degrees of anterior vaginal wall prolapse with or without uh, 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 uterine prolapse, particularly when the, uh, the BA point on the part Q is more, they will have higher chances of obstructive symptoms. So when I say the BA point, that is what it means. A denotes a erythrovasical junction. BA denotes the most distal point in the anterior vaginal wall, the maximum descent. So if it is more, 
then the chances of occurrence of bladder outlet obstruction is high. So similarly, the high grade prolapse, they predis predispose to obstructive voiding symptoms, uh, chronic residual urine, and uh, rarely even uh, bilateral uh, hydroerythronephrosis uh, and uh, renal failure. But small sister seal, uh, they are um, with more, they will have the stress urinary incontinence as a symptom than obstructive symptoms. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a complex relationship between the anterior vaginal wall prolapse and voiding. Intact retrovesical angle is related to voiding difficulty and funneling and opening uh, indicates the improved voiding. And similarly, the picture shows you how an advanced anterior vaginal wall prolapse can lead to urethral kinking. So that can uh, uh, predispose to the bladder outlet obstruction. So ladies and gentlemen, if there is uh, urethral hypermobility, if you do urethropexy alone without addressing the existing anterior vaginal wall uh, de descent, over time, gradually the vaginal wall prolapse will progress and will cause the kinking of the urethrovesical angle and lead to bladder outflow obstruction, irritative symptoms and obstructive symptoms. So the cause may be urethropexy or secondary prolapse or both may have caused the bladder outlet obstruction. Am I audible? I could hear some disturbances. Yes, yeah, you're audible. Man. Okay, man. okay, sir. So the cause for the obstruction may be the post erythropexy related problem, or it may be the secondary prolapse, and both might contribute to the uh, bladder outlet obstruction. So if you reduce if you reduce the prolapse, and that will uh, uh, that will unveil the mechanism of the bladder outlet obstruction, will guide us to choose surgical correction, either correction of the anterior vaginal wall prolapse or whether we should combine the erythrolysis. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, urodynamics testing with reduced, uh, reduced prolapse will improve the flow and the avoiding detrosuppression. So this is the picture showing you without the pessary showing a low flow and high pressure. On the contrary, with the prolapse, Reducing uh, with uh, reduced by the pessary, you can see there is an increased flow rate and a normal widening pressure. <coughs> Fitzgerald uh, he showed that it could be the best predictor of postoperative normalcy, provided you do the preoperative widening studies with the prolapse red reduced using a pessary. <coughs> what about the overactive bladder symptoms with the pelvic organ prolapse. There is increased uh, uh, over, uh, prevalence of overactive bladder symptoms in the group with, of women with pelvic organ prolapse. Similarly, urge incontinence can be as high as 88% in the group with pelvic organ prolapse. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Burroughs and Dietz have shown less advanced is the prolapse, then the higher chances of the patient having urgency and urgent incontinence. Mirani reported contrarily. So ladies and gentlemen, it is true, if the prolapse is advanced anterior vaginal wall prolapse, <coughs> then the prevalence of trabeculation is likely to be high. Severe trabeculation is, is considered as a, a risk factor to detect the persistent urinary incontinence after the uh, repair of the prolapse. A study in which uh, the urodynamics was done and they have detected 41% of detrus are under activity in these patients. Uh, it shows that women with prolapse with um, um, increased anterior vaginal wall descent then they are likely to have more avoiding symptoms. 
more likely to have trabeculations, tetros are under activity and increase post void residue, but are less likely to have urgent continence or tetros are over activity. So the POP repair will relieve the outflow tract obstruction and voiding symptoms of tetros are under activity. In, in short, if you can just consider this, it will be of great use to you. In less advanced descent than Trivagen and Paul, the, uh, the, there is higher chances of having the overactive bladder symptoms, urgent continence due to detrusor overactivity, and higher chance of having stress urinary incontinence, lesser chance of having the bladder outlet obstruction, trapeculation, or detrusor underactivity. <coughs> Similarly, if you take the advanced prolapse cases, advanced anterior vaginal prolapse with or without uterine prolapse, then the bladder outlet obstruction is likely to be high, trabeculation is likely to be more, detrusor under activity is likely to be higher, and the stress incontinence and overactive bladder symptoms are likely to be less. So ladies and gentlemen, what happens when the patient has prolapse, bladder outlet obstruction, and stress incontinence? So if your patient has anterior vaginal wall descent with or without a uterine descent stage three or four, particularly if the BA point is more, <coughs> then the patient will have more of obstructive symptoms. Similarly, with increased degrees of anterior vaginal wall prolapse with or without uterine prolapse, the occurrence of stress incontinence will be less because the, uh, the pelvic organ prolapse causes bladder outlet obstruction due to anatomical distortion and urethral kinking, whereas <coughs> prolapse does not cause stress incontinence. It will mask the uh, sphincter incompetency and make her appear continent. So, what you need to plan is when women have, um, they often notice decrease in urinary incontinence as the prolapse progresses as a result of increase in bladder outlet obstruction. <coughs> when you correct, repair the prolapse or just reduce it with a pessary, the patient will be relieved of the bladder outlet obstruction it will unmask the stress urinary incontinence if the patient has a sphincter incompetency. So uh, after correcting the prolapse, then the patient will be relieved of the obstructive symptoms, but they can present with stress urinary incontinence. That is what we refer as occult stress incontinence. <coughs> How common is occult stress incontinence? The higher, the, the severe the prolapse, it can occur even up to 87% of the cases. So always we wonder, should we do simply an anterior vaginal wall prolapse or apical, uh, apical prolapse repair, or should we combine the stress urinary incontinence with an anti-incontinence procedure? Ladies and gentlemen, the, if you're planning to do any anti-incontinence procedure, you should do the urodynamic study. Uh, you, you, there is no need for you to do urodynamic study for all the pelvic organ problems, unless your patient has pre-existing neurological disease or recurrent urinary infection, or if you are planning to combine an anti-incontinence surgery. But please do remember, presence or absence of detrusor overactivity, bladder outlet obstruction, <coughs> or tetrusor under activity does not alter surgical plan. And uh, you need to do pre-operative urodynamics with the pelvic organ prolapse reduced using a pessary, which can identify the occult stress incontinence and which will permit you to counsel your patient whether to have a uh, combined anti-incontinence procedure in the same sitting or to do it in the second system. Ladies and gentlemen, it is worth always remembering that when you do urodynamic study with the, with the prolapse reduced um, to, uh, to confirm the uh, presence or absence of stress incontinence, you should always use the 
<coughs> the AUA guidelines or any accepted guidelines that you adopt. And then that with the pessary reducing the prolapse, you do the urodynamic study, and that will help you to assess uh, the detrusor dysfunction and can help you to differentiate bladder outlet obstruction from detrusor underactivity. What is uh, the place of using pessary in prolapse cases, either in the presence of bladder outlet obstruction or with or without stress urinary incontinence? Uh, it is it is true that uh, the pessary has both diagnostic and the therapeutic role in managing the uh, pelvic organ prolapse with the outlet obstruction and in sphincter incompetency and stress urinary incontinence. It is a, a very um, a well um, highlighted point. And if your patient has level one, two, three defect, along with the pillar outlet obstruction or uh, stress urinary incontinence, how should it be treated? So what we do is, <clears throat> if your patient has See, what really happens is, if a patient has no stress urinary incontinence, only prolapse with the bladder outlet obstruction, you do the repair and reconstruction, anterior repair. And if there is a significant uterine descent, if needed, you can combine the hysterectomy along with that. And if your patient has the uh, outlet obstruction as well as stress urinary incontinence, either overt or occult, your prolapse repair will relieve the patient from the bladder outlet obstruction symptoms, but it will not cure the stress urinary incontinence. For you to relieve her from stress urinary incontinence, so when there is an overt stress incontinence, you can combine the repair of both, or if there is no stress incontinence, you look for an occult incontinence, you can counsel the patient and do a single stage correction, or you can uh, do a, uh, uh, double stage correction. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude by saying the anterior wall descent, anterior compartmental defect with or without apical defect has anatomical and functional consequences. So with less advanced uh, prolapse, you will have more of overactive bladder symptoms, more of stress incontinence problem if the patient has finger incompetence. And the outlet obstructions are likely to be less, trabeculations likely to be less, detrusor under activity is likely to be less. But with advanced descent, the outlet obstruction will be significant, detrusor under activity will be uh, significant, but the stress incontinence and overactive bladder symptoms will be less. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is an anterior vaginal wall prolapse, you are justified in doing a native tissue repair, a typical anterior calporaphy. But it is essential to restore the transverse attachment. It is crucial and correct all the existing defects, particularly the apical defect. Otherwise, recurrence will occur. Then, when there is a um, uh, non-recurrent cystocele, the native tissue repair is generally recommended. But if it is a recurrent anterior vaginal wall descent, you can explain the risk and the benefit profile to your patient and consider using the synthetic polypropylene mesh for, as a repair. So the associated apical suspension, when there is an apical defect along with anterior vaginal wall descent, will give a, uh, um, minimize the chances of recurrence if you address both problems. So you should correct the anterior vaginal wall descent as well as the apical descent. It, is, it has grade A recommendation and adequate evidence. Similarly, when there is a bladder outlet obstruction with prolapse, you just do the repair for the uh, prolapse. And if, if there is a need for uh, hysterectomy, you can combine it. Otherwise, you can just go ahead and repair the anterior vaginal wall descent uh, because presence of outflow obstruction, detrusor activity or under activity, they do not change the surgical planning. On the contrary, 
if the patient has progressively increasing uh, prolapse, there is the chance of urinary incontinence gets less because of the increase in outflow tract obstruction. If you correct it or reduce it, it will relieve the outflow, outflow tract obstruction symptoms, but will unmask the stress incontinence if the patient has sphincter incompetency. So the patients after correction will present for the first time with significant uh, stress urinary incontinence. So in the presence of stress urinary incontinence along with bladder outlet obstruction and pelvic organ prolapse, you have to have a separate protocol. So when there is an avert stress incontinence, you can combine the anti-incontinence repair. When there is no stress incontinence, look for occult incontinence and counsel your patient and plan it as, as a single stage repair or as a, um, a, a two stage repair. I thank the Urological Society for the opportunity and I'll be happy to uh, take any questions if you have. I think I was seeing the chat box. So there are not many questions when, because oh. uh, this, uh, uh, the candidates would uh, uh, probably will have less exposure uh, in this subject. Uh, but uh, no, just for their knowledge, ma'am, um, uh, can I ask you questions? Sure, sir. Please go ahead. Ma'am, you, you, you were talking about the mesh uh, that... Uh, uh, in interior compartment collapse. In your practice, are you using mesh or you use always a native tissue repair? Huh? Actually, uh, I used mesh long time ago, a few years ago, and we have stopped using mesh. We concentrate more on, on the facial and native tissue repair. And it is possible to give a quite a good, effective, uh, successful outcome with the restoration of transverse attachment and the application of the fascia. But if there is a recurrent prolapse, then I will certainly discuss it with the patient and I can continue using the either uh, using the mesh patch as a overlay or uh, it, uh, we can even uh, pre-design the uh, mesh and then use it. It is okay. only reserved for recurrent anterior vaginal wall prolapse, not for the regular cases. And which will be this uh, mesh one? Any, any uh, mesh, uh, um, polypropylene mesh, macroporous mesh, soft mesh, lightweight mesh is preferable over the stiff mesh. There are mesh, it is not the same mesh as the, what is being used for the herniography and other things. These mesh are soft, lightweight, macroporous, which will promote the growth of fibroblast and likely to have less reaction, so, but we always make it a point to explain it to the patient and they have to accept the uh, possible mesh extrusion and other complication which can occur with the uh, uh, mesh related procedures. Uh, are there, uh, yeah, okay, there are some more questions. Um, Okay, so someone has asked for the training opportunity. Of course, we are planning for that. And please stay uh, in uh, touch with us and we will uh, let you know about that. And um, the, we, we are planning to have a, a program of uh, live demonstrations and uh, uh, a hybrid meeting in uh, July 1st, 2nd, 3rd at Chennai. And uh, all of you feel free to join us so that you can see all kinds of facial repair demonstrated for the pelvic organ prolapse. Um, uh, sorry, ma'am, my connection got a little problem. Um, oh. I think there is one question from the chat box. If you can read it and answer, that was by Deepak Kapoor. I'm just sure. logging on uh, from my laptop. Okay, okay. Yeah. So let me uh, let me read it. There is a question. Uh, with the sister seal and the apical defect, we do the traditional repair and sacrospinous fixation. See, it depends upon the, if the apical descent is a stage three, stage four, you have the option. Either you can go in for sacrospinous ligament fixation, you can go for high uterosacral ligament fixation, 
or whatever you are trained to do it. But if the prolapse after the hysterectomy, if it lies within the hymen, then it would be adequate if you go and do the McCall's caldoplasty. So it depends, it depends, it depends upon the... Horse, 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 horse. See, it is sacrospinous fixation is not a must in all the cases. If you want to conserve the, there is another question. If you want to conserve the uterus and do the repair, certainly you can do it. What we do is we, uh, we just make a midline incision, dissect the vaginal wall away from the underlying tissues. And then what we do is we just fix the pubocervical fascia to the pericervical ring, followed by plication in the midline. So that is the trans restoration of transverse attachment as well as plication in the midline. So uh, combining these two will certainly help. Uh, when there is no need for an uh, hysterectomy, you can simply do the facial repair without resorting to it. Uh, Ma'am, I was on that question uh, regarding the mesh. So if you are using mesh, uh, is this the mesh which you use for uh, the abdominal hernia or it's a special mesh for um, uh, from Ethicon, the prolapse? Uh, yeah, which we yes, use? sir. Um, I, actually, I don't prefer using the hernia mesh because uh, the hernia mesh is a bit stiff and um, we believe in using the soft, lightweight, Macroporous polypropylene mesh, which is specially designed for it. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Now um, uh, you are talking about uh, uh, the anterior compartment prolapse. You talk about the, the vaginal hysterectomy also. Now the question here is: should We deal with the situations. Uh, these all this prolapse and um, uh, vaginal hysterectomy. You know, there's a uh, the distension. The vagina is commodious, capacious. Uh, making the flap is a little easy. So let us assume we have to, the, the residents have to learn making a good vaginal flaps uh, for their, uh, uh, for their uh, use. So in, in other than these conditions, uh, what are your recommendations? How, what are your tips for making a good, uh, robust vaginal flaps? Um, actually, um, when we, um, Actually, I should thank uh, Professor Arun Chawla for uh, making me do uh, a couple of topics uh, like uh, vaginal flap and, uh, and the anterior compartmental defect repairs because uh, based on his request, I just started just filtering and uh, preparing the text and everything. So thank you very much, sir. It is a nice question. See, the flap, see, when you, when you are planning to do a uh, uh, mesh augmented procedure. The first message that I want to give is mesh is not a recommended procedure for anterior vaginal wall prolapse or for apical prolapse. But if it is a recurrent case, certainly one can consider it provided your patient accepts the complication. So what we do when you make an incision and dissect the vaginal wall away from the underlying tissue. That is what Professor Chavla is referring as the vaginal flap. That is the vaginal wall, which is uh, with <clears throat> vascularization. And I uh, you know once you just approximate it, it will very easily heal. But only thing is what we do is when we do only a native tissue repair, we just dissect away as much of pubocervical fascia uh, from the vaginal wall as possible. Because some patients will have good amount of pubocervical fascia. Some patients will have very much thinned out. And you know, they, you have to take care to dissect the pubocervical fascia totally from the vaginal wall. And then you approximate it. Because how do you differentiate pubocervical fascia from the bladder? The pubocervical fascia will be whitish like a fish meat, whereas the bladder will be reddish. You know that it will be like a red meat. So what we do, we just dissect the tissue, save as much as possible, and then you approximate it. And what is more important is fix the fascia back to the pericervical ring, if you are preserving the uterus, or fix the fascia to the newly created vault, 
if you have if you are combining it with hysterectomy that is what is called the restoration of transos attachment that should take care of both paravaginal defect as well as the midline defect that is one thing but if you are planning for a um, if it is a case of a recurrent prolapse operated elsewhere a couple of times recurrent prolapse you need to um, do a repair then you can consider the mesh procedure in that case i will not dissect the so much of meticulous dissection of the pubic cervical fascia from the vaginal wall because i would like to leave some fascia on the vaginal wall if i am planning to interpose a mesh to augment the repair that is the tip that we have to remember it similarly the mesh will be attached to the peri cervical ring or the newly created wall depending upon the situation is that what you wanted sir is there anything yeah no ma'am yeah. i'll have a little addition to that no mm -hmm. when we are talking about uh, cysto seals and uh, the vagina stectomy you know something is coming towards you the, the vagina is coming towards you it's easy to make uh, flaps but what yes. happens is the common scenario which our agent faces uh, uh, putting a subutral sling which is in the form of mesh whether is the tot or or tvt or inside out and number 2 is vaginal repair of ivf so sometimes they are not sure um, whether we are uh, undermining the vaginal or whether uh, we are going too deep um, uh, into the tissues so uh, we want to know from your experience uh, uh, the tips for a, uh, uh, the vaginal flaps in these two special situations they i actually if uh, you see it's a tvt or tot whatever it is then it is uh, it is recommended that you have a thick vaginal flap that should be the, uh, the the thick vaginal flap what i mean is other than the vagina there will be some of the pubic cervical fascia left over it that might minimize the chances of mesh extrusion and other complications and do you suggest uh, infiltrating with normal saline with or without adrenaline when you are raising the flap actually repair? the repair yes it's a good question sir um, uh, i normally do it uh, with the infiltration uh, one in 2000 um, it's that is 1 ml diluted in 200 ml of normal saline provided the patient has no cardiac issues then we infiltrate it and it uh, creates a, a very good uh, distension and minimizes the uh, bleeding and helps you to identify the fascia very well even if the patient has a thinned out uh, 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 pubic cervical fascia Uh, and you don't enter into the bladder and uh, you know it, re it really creates a um, a good uh, edematous tissue in between the bladder and the vaginal wall hemostatic as well as it helps okay. uh, no ma'am uh, we have uh, uh, some residents who are in the centers where laparoscopy and robotic is available and uh, we have some residents who don't have exposure to this we want to know from your experience we know that the the anterior compartment collapse will will have a combination of uh, cysto seal with apical compartment collapse or sometimes uh, posterior compartment in combination and sometimes with sui so we want to know from your experience which procedures can be done either whether they are occurring alone or in combination vaginally which procedures can be done robotically or laparoscopically that means the through abdominal road and which procedures can be done in combination both vaginally and the uh, abdominal approach we are we are talking about the prolapse different types of prolapse with or without sure okay sir <clears throat> actually um uh, the uh, the robo has come into practice uh, only recently so we back when we were uh, operating then uh, we were uh, just keen on repairing vaginally so laparoscopic or robotic it means additional three ports for laparoscope and five ports for robotic surgery and plus the the added um, uh, expense but still there are added advantages also with the such advanced uh, cutting edge technology but initially what we were doing is when i am having a patient with the level 1 2 defect stage 3 4 prolapse or stage 2 prolapse 
And uh, we have been using the fascial repair technique with or without hysterectomy. We either go in for the um, high uterosacral ligament suspension or a very good fascial repair, which should take care of the um, anterior compartment as well as the apical compartment defect. So the sacrospinous ligament suspension has the disadvantage of a high recurrence rate of anterior vaginal wall descent up to 40%. So we try to avoid it. But some, some of our patients will be very keen on having, um, uh, uh, say, supposing they have a vault prolapse. And uh, when you give the option for a sacrocarpopexy, uh, either a, a open or the uh, robotic procedure, and the vaginal option, they insist on having the vaginal procedure. Then I will be going in for sacrospinous ligament fixation. If I am doing the high uterosacral ligament suspension or the sacrospinous ligament suspension or McCall's caldoplasty for level one, level two prolapse with along with sphincter incompetency, I will combine a mid urethral sling along with the prolapse repair. But if it is a case of uh, sacrocolpopexy. And, uh, you know, it, it see the evidence says that when you are planning for abdominal uh, sacrocolpopexy, better not to combine it with abdominal hysterectomy. So if it is a case of vault prolapse, and if I am planning for a abdominal sacrocolpopexy, either laparoscopic or robotic, we can combine the birch colpo suspension along with that. So you, we, I, we have the option if we have, I'm doing the uh, open operation, I may even combine the pubovaginal sling along with that. Only thing is, we just uh, the, confirm the diagnosis, occult or overt, and uh, discuss with the patient if she wants the same sitting uh, correction, then depending upon the approach which we use. So many of our patients are keen on vaginal operations, then we either go in for the mid-urethral sling or a pubovaginal sling, uh, where pubovaginal sling will be a, a combined approach like. So if it is purely an abdominal or laparoscopic robotic approach, then we can plan for the uh, birch colpo suspension along with the addressing. But when you do the uh, birch, we can always take the opportunity to reattach the fascia, the cervical fascia back to the white line. And the evidence also shows if you repair the paravaginal defect abdominally, either by open or laparoscopic or robotic, the success rate is likely to be higher compared to the vaginal approach of doing the sacrospinous ligament suspension and doing the vaginal repair. So uh, depending upon this, we prefer there is evidence to show that when you repair the paravaginal defect along with sacrocarpopexy, by robotic or uh, open operation, the success is likely to be higher. Correct. Um, I think, um, let me see Mem chat box again, if there are any question. There's a comment from Dr. Joseph Philip Raj. Uh, no. He mentions that, uh, uh, what is your experience? Uh, uh, use of synthetic mesh for the repair has better result compared to native tissue. Mm -hmm. So actually, there is one more question. For combined mm -hmm. procedures, sling procedure or TOT is preferable. See, uh, in the beginning of 2000, uh, we were using the uh, TVT. TVT came first. And then uh, we were using the retropubic route. And uh, it was quite effective. For a, for a, it was a big breakthrough in the management of stress incontinence. Mm -hmm. It was effective. And considering the complications and uh, a French surgeon designed the transoperator approach and we were using it. But off late, even the availability of the TOT, TVT kits are, uh, it has come down. It's not freely available. And um, the, the European countries and uh, other countries have almost banned the use of these uh, uh, kits, uh, TVT, TOT kits. So, People are nowadays going in more for birch carpo suspension and pubo vaginal mm -hmm. sling rather than the using the uh, mesh involved uh, uh, kits. But still, uh, if the I just make sure whether the patient has a, a intrinsic sphincter deficiency, predominant uh, sphincter incompetency. In that case, I will rather go in for either a pubo vaginal sling 
using patient's own uh, rectus fascia or fascia lata, or uh, if this is acceptable to the patient, I will go in for what is called the retropubic mediurethral slit. So only if it is a case of predominantly urethral hypermobility, that is not uh, only you know, uh, see with the uh, very full bladder she leaks and it is not disturbing her day-to-day -day activities so much, but still, mm -hmm. which is likely to get worse after the prolapse repair, then mm -hmm. we undertake uh, using the transoperator approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is the answer for the one question. The other question is a uh, use of synthetic mesh for repair has better results compared to native tape. What is the outcome in your experience? Yes, uh, the use of mesh, polypropylene mesh, has um, uh, a superior results with reference to the anatomical outcome uh, during the follow-up, yes. But it is always associated with mesh-related complication like mesh extrusion, fibrosis, and uh, sometimes very rarely mesh extrusion into the uh, bladder, urethra, forming stones, recurrent urinary tract infections, all those things. So um, as much as possible, both for prolapse as well as for urinary incontinence, we try to avoid mesh and reserve mesh only for the worst situations. Have I answered, sir? I think he is not there to. So it was fine, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, now the common scenario. Last, last situation to you. Um, you are doing vaginal spectomy. Uh, you are planning anterior colporephy, and at the same time, you are planning to do anti-incontinence procedures. So, how do you manage this patient? How? Uh, what is your procedure of choice? Is it uh, um, after hysterectomy part? Um, I will. Uh, I will dissect the. Um, uh, I'll see for the hysterectomy. We make an encircling incision. We don't make the uh, inverted T, uh, T insertion. So I'll just initially make an uh, um, encircling incision and then cut the vesico cervical ligament, uh, mobilize the bladder away from the uterus, then open the pouch of Douglas, proceed with the hysterectomy. After completing hysterectomy with the salpingectomy or ophorectomy, whatever it is, then we just make a midline incision and reflect the vaginal wall away from the pubic cervical fascia and the bladder. At this juncture, after doing that, I will place the uh, sling. If I'm doing a, a retropubic or a transoperator sling, because the uh, you know with the with the uh, sister seal and the descent, uh, the whole bladder will be coming down like this. And uh, if you are using a a retropubic um, mediurethral sling, the chances of injuring the bladder is much less. So what I'll do is I will place the sling, do the check cystoscopy, then proceed with the sister seal repair. Then finally, fine tune the uh, mesh tension and close the mediurethra. That is what I follow. And I think it uh, it serves well. Okay. Uh, so, good evening, uh, ma'am. Uh, one sec. Uh, it's Dr. Philip. Uh, that yes, regarding sir. my question on the outcomes with the synthetic mesh, have you compared your results with native tissue repair or use of synthetic grafts? Number two, when do you advocate use of synthetic mesh for this repair? Is it in recurrence cases or in the first time only is there any indication where you have to use the synthetic mesh for the repair? Yes, sir. It is a good question. And um, I would like to answer the second part of it first. That is, um, what we do is, um, you have asked for uh, whether have I, have I compared my results of native tissue with uh, mesh procedures. We yeah. have, I, I have not... Uh, done a study, but there is literature uh, review and publications which says the polypropylene mesh repair outcome is excellent compared to the native tissue repairs. And, um, uh, but, the, but for the complications part, but it is not my own results. 
but it is the research done by uh, others which has the, um, uh, the level of evidence and a grade of recommendation. So we reserve the usage of polypropylene mesh for the anterior vaginal wall descent only for cases where there is recurrent anterior vaginal wall descent, not otherwise. If it is a primary case, I will just do a fascial repair. I will approximate the pubocervical fascia and reattach the fascia back to the pericervical ring or back to the newly created wall. Is it okay, sir? Have you have I answered you? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'll come back to the same question. So you um, mentioned about uh, a circular incision, uh, then um, uh, finishing the mobilization of bladder, completion of hysterectomy, but you will not uh, proceed with the calporephy. Uh, no. Before, okay. And this I incision will for co complete yeah. the hysterectomy. Hmm. Well, after completing hysterectomy, then I will make a midline incision. This will be subutural incision. Uh, midline this incision. Separate. Separate so, so, incision. Yeah, it is separate, but it will be joining the uh, the circumferential incision. Distally, it will join the trans, uh, the um, elliptical incision which I made for the hysterectomy. Yeah, so uh, exactly that. What we see is when we join this incision, there is a lot of free space available for the mesh or the sling to uh, occupy in the in the behind the suburethra. So, is is there any way we can keep both incisions separate and uh, uh, finish anti-incontinence procedure away from the area of mobilization? Um, and vaginal yes, sir. See, when I say the anterior repair, anterior calporaphy. It's a midline incision from, uh, say, 12 o'clock up to the uh, suburethral level in the midline we do, and then mobilize the vaginal wall away from the underlying tissue. And for the to place the sling, I make a separate incision okay. Okay. Uh, for the mediurethral sling. Okay. So, so it is separate be because the idea is I don't want to meddle with the blood and neck part, urethrovesical yes. junction. I want to preserve it. Excellent. So this will be always a sling or you will put mesh also on occasions? Actually, um, um, the, for, the, uh, for the stress incontinence, sir? Yes, yes, and during... Uh, yeah. and so uh, still we are using the, uh, the uh, mesh, uh, the polypropylene mesh, which comes with the kit and uh, we are using it. But I, I just make it a point to make sure that these, these women have a uh, significant urinary leakage and they can't really manage without the sling procedures and they used to ha uh, have the pads to manage to contain the leakage and it is uh, predominantly an intrinsic sphincter deficiency. In these cases, I prefer going in for the uh, uh, retropubic mediurethral sleep. Thank you, ma'am. I think um, I'll just go to the chat box again. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, we are done with the uh, question answer from the chat box. There are no, no more questions. And on behalf of uh, Urology Society of India and Indian School of Urology, a great thanks to you for a very, very uh, uh, comprehensive presentation of the prolapse, well supported by uh, nice pictures uh, and uh, uh, good videos. Uh, I think a very erudite and a very lucid presentation from you, Ma'am. Thank you uh, very much and uh, thanks. Uh, all the residents and the members of USI who have attended this class. Uh, thanks, Namneet and Kiran, for the logistics support. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am, again, and uh, good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm particularly grateful to you because you are the one first who asked me to do the presentation in Coimbatore. And yeah. then um, I would like to thank you and uh, Kesho Murthy, sir, uh, who was quite without any hesitation. You wanted to include this topic. And uh, I think we should go on be doing the other uh, parts of the prolapse, like apical prolapse and other things, provided uh, if, if it uh, will yes. be of use to them. We'll cover that. Right. Yeah. Thank Good you. evening, ma'am. Thank you. My sister Philomena is my classmate. Oh, thank you, sir. I will convey it to her. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you once Thank again. You. Have Bye. a great day. Okay. Bye.